awesome to be with you. Did he gargle Red Bull before he came out tonight? He was on it. How much caffeine has that man had? I mean, that's incredible. Listen, it's a joy to be with you. So thankful, so privileged to be a part of this weekend, uh, to join in with uh, the other guys and just share stuff, stuff into your hearts. And uh, it's, a, it's a privilege. I count it an honor and a privilege to be here. And yet we had, um, uh, we had some people come and take our ladies. Um, and we gladly gave them up. But I delivered, Sharon. That was the delivery service. <laughs> I even, you know. And uh, do you know what? Our church, our church is, is, is filled with amazing worship leaders. Do you know why? We weren't scared to sow the best we had. The, we were just planted. We were traveling itinerant, weren't we? We just planted the church. And uh, in my heart, I knew that Sharon um, was, was Phil's wife. And uh, I was like, no, Lord, no, Lord. She's so good, Lord. We haven't got another worship leader. And Stuart didn't know what was coming on him either. Um, but, you know, when the Lord says sow something and you're obedient to what he says sow, there's always a harvest. Never be afraid to sow. In, in a world that's breathing in, be a sowing person. Amen. Amen. Let's live in the things we say we know. Okay? I'm not here tonight to talk to you as crowd. I'm here tonight to talk about to you as disciples. Because when you talk to crowd, you have to water it down. You have to um, watch what you say. There's things you can't really say that you want to say. But I'm not talking to crowd tonight. Amen. I'm talking to disciples. There's a difference between crowd and disciples, you see. And Jesus was a phenomenal crowd splitter. He had crowds, but he brought out of the crowd disciples. And I just want to honor Phil and Sharon. They're crowd splitters. They walk into a crowd and they see disciples. And just as Christ did, they pull those disciples out. No matter what they look like, no matter what they sound like, no matter what their background was. They've got this anointing. To pull people out of a crowd and say there's so much more than just standing, clapping and watching. Amen. Would you like it? And tonight this room isn't filled with crowd. Otherwise I'd have to be funny, do a dance and give you a poem. <laughs> if I give my heart to you, I'll have none and you'll have two. I don't know where that came from. It was just a quick poem came through there. But with disciples, you see, with disciples... You can just talk about kingdom stuff. And you know, I love Jesus, the crowd splitter. Because there's people here and you know that you were taken from the crowd. Because the crowd and disciples are very different things, you see. I remember once thinking and asking the Lord, didn't you ever get sick of the crowd? Because they were just there all day, weren't they? Gimme, gimme for me, for my mum, for my auntie. Come over here. Do something for me. I said, Jesus, like I have a few minutes of that and it sickens me. How did you deal with that all the time? And I felt the Lord say to me, because you see, I had another ministry over here. And my joy was in the disciples that I was making. You see, the difference between crowd and disciple is the crowd is there for what it can get. The disciples there for what it can become. And tonight I want to talk to you as people who are becoming. And listen, I'm so thankful for what you're doing in the nations. We've had a dear friendship for coming on 30 years now. And we will always champion you on, always cheer your corner, always provide wives for your, your men. <laughs> <coughs> We're in covenant and we have been for years. Time has proved it. People were cheap with covenant today. But you know what? 30 years will prove a lot. There's people here today and you've been taken from the crowd and now you're standing as a disciple. I want to say to you, this is where it gets exciting. Because the crowd, they get to watch miracles. Disciples get to handle them. <laughs> See, a lot of people don't want to be disciple. They want to be crowd because it's convenient. The convenient get to watch. Disciples get to handle miracles. Jesus never gave the bread and the fish to some crowd observers. He called his disciples and said, you've seen me doing some miracles. Would you like to feel it when it happens in your hands? 
This room is filled with disciples, and I want to honor the apostle of this work and the visionary of this work. I honestly believe that your best days are are here, but they're tomorrow. They're, they're, They're coming at you furiously. Amen. And you're ready for them. You're ready for them. Now, we're here over this next few nights and the next few days to talk about revival. Now, I had a message on my heart when I was came, coming here, and uh, I kind of got bored of it. So um, I'm not going to share that one. I could, but I just sensed as I walked in here, the Lord saying, oh, why don't you just go off-road? Is there anyone here that likes going off-road? There is, okay? Because we could stay on the tarmac. Now, don't, don't despise the tarmac. I am a missionary to tarmac and concrete. <laughs> the need on concrete is no different to the need on dusty streets. You're not a missionary when you're in the third world. Missionary is a state of being that's our very lifestyle. When we leave our door, we are missionaries. Our Jerusalem is vitally important as well as our Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But you see, we're going to have revival this week, but I don't want to talk so much about how to, how to have revival in a mode that we're attending something, rather how to live in that. Because you see, we don't need any more revivals in our nations, that are like circuses, that people come to and they experience something for a moment, they get some candy floss or, or a toffee apple and a balloon. But four days later when the circus has left town, the balloon's gone down and people are saying, did something happen? That was never God's plan. God's plan was a lifestyle of revival for those that follow him. And this moment in COVID where the doors are shutting and the gates are being bolted, I'm actually quite excited because someone said to me, how do you feel about the church being closed? I said, my church isn't being closed because the church was never a building. It was never a meeting. It was a community of people called out of darkness into light. It's a, it's a community of people who are followers of Jesus. We're not meant to visit revivals. We're meant to be revivals. We're meant to start revivals, but we won't start revivals unless this is all right. This message, I'm glad we, I'm glad we came off road. This is much better than what I had planned. It really is. This really is. I had revival in my bathroom this morning. And you'll be glad to know I was on my own. Well, actually, that's not true. I'm never alone. Because God's spirit isn't in a building waiting for me. But he now calls me home. I want to share with you three words. Three words that are amazing words. These are some of the most important words in my life. Three words that have kept me strong when things came to break me. I I want to share these words with you because they're three words that stopped me quitting. I never really felt like quitting, but if I had, it definitely would have stopped me. People said, did you not want to quit? No, never. From the moment I left the crowd and started to follow Jesus, I've never wanted to quit. I've been terrified, scared silly, but never bored. This is amazing. Jesus never said you must be bored again. He said you must be born again. And when you're born again, something begins to change. You see, I want to share three words with you tonight. Three words that have kept me in a state of personal revival from the moment I met him. I'm glad for the corporate anointing, but it's not what I rely on. In fact, when we discover personal revival for ourselves, we actually bring a flame to the building. And we stop being voids that come to suck everyone else's discipline into our life. What's going to change this world isn't the people that know how to hold revival. It's the people who know how to be revival. How to stir revival in their lives. Each that three words. How many words? Just checking. Three words that have kept me in a condition of revival. Okay. Now, I want to apologize because they're really simple. What you will discover of me is I'm a very simple person. 
Because I think Jesus was also. He wasn't out to confuse. But you see, sometimes in our world today, there's a hunger to discover things that we don't yet know. But the problem is people aren't committed to knowing correctly the things they say they know. So though these words are only three, and when I say them and refer to where I found them, some of you in your hearts will say, I knew that. My question is, okay, if you know it, are you living in the good of it? Because, typical Vaughan verse coming right now, warning for those who loved Vaughan, here comes the typical Vaughan verse. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2. Let the man who says he knows, <laughs> let him know he doesn't know as he ought. <laughs> that is such a Vaughan verse. It's like a little mystery verse, isn't it? It's like, it's like Paul was having like this kind of Chinese mystery moment, isn't it? It's like, let a man who says he knows, let him know he doesn't know as he ought. But the reality is, we've got too many people running around saying they know things. And they may know them in their heads, but they haven't got a revelation of those things in their spirit. And until they start to know by the Holy Ghost, they won't live in the good of what they say they know. So I don't stop preaching when someone looks at me with that look that says, I knew that. I'm like, come on, it's time to get over yourself and begin to say, come on, Holy Ghost. Take me from a knowing in my head to a revelation. You see, the evidence of you truly know. Knowing is are you living in the good of it? Sometimes in church you say to people, do you believe and do you know about speaking in tongues? Do you do it? And suddenly there's not so many hands. You see, speaking in tongues should be a part of our lifestyle. Evangelism should be a part of our lifestyle. All these things that religion has made a stage event are leaving the stage and coming back into the lifestyle of a believer. And I love that. My battle cry if I was a revolutionary is, come on, give the church back to Jesus and the power back to the people. Let's get ministry off of the stage. Enough greatest showman. Let's begin to get the whole church prophesying. Let's begin to get the whole church evangelizing. Let's begin to get the whole church pastoring each other. And actually, we won't have found anything new. We would have just returned to what's real. Three words. How many words? Three. Three. Okay, okay, okay. These words, man, they've kept me fresh. Fresh. When other people got boring, I didn't. They kept me alive. Who wants to know these words? Okay, okay, easy. We'll get to them. We'll get to them. Don't be so pushy. If the announcements take two hours, wait to see how long my message lasts. <laughs> Shut. Three words. You see, the gospel proclaims many things. It proclaims new life obtained through death. But the gospel also proclaims to us that Jesus has removed the separation between God and man. The message of the gospel declares that the separation that was in place between God and man, established through the disobedience of the man Adam, has now been removed. Through the obedience of Jesus Christ. Come on, think about that. Let the man who says, oh, no, right. no, no, stop, stop. Think about that. We now, in Christ, have oneness with God. No less a oneness than what Adam knew with him. Actually, better because Adam walked on the earth. We are seated in heavenly places. Hmm. There's no longer anything separating us from oneness and unity with God. He's taken us. Again, these are so simple, but these are things we need to think about. He's taken us in Christ 
from separation and didn't leave us in some vacant lot. But he placed us in Christ. Come on, this is stuff that's worth thinking about. I'm no longer outside of Christ because the separation has been removed and the Lord, you see, not myself, not good works, the Lord snatched me out of the kingdom of darkness and placed me in his son. That's mind-blowing. I was meditating on this recently. And I was thinking, wow. Because you see, the Holy Spirit, he takes things that you know. And he causes them to drop into your Noah. He causes revelation. That's why I often say to people, don't write books too soon because you think you know what you're talking about. But you don't know as you ought. He took me from a separated condition that I inherited in Adam and placed me in his son. And now when I read the Bible, it says I'm justified because I'm in him. (laughs) I'm righteous with his own righteousness because I'm in him. Then Galatians, you turn and it says, I now have sonship because I'm no longer separated. I'm in him. There's no condemnation for me now. Why? Because I'm in him. There's many other thoughts on being in him. In him needs to be threaded through the gospel that you preach. Otherwise you preach a gospel of behavior modification. That doesn't cause the transformation that the new creation deserves. But then it's like you're hit with that thought. And then you get hit with another one. Of his doing, I'm no longer separated. And he's placed me in him. That would be enough, wouldn't it? Come on, that's more than fair. But God said, I've not finished yet. Now I'm going to take my spirit and put it in you. Put him in you. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Oh, I know that. Are you living in the good of it? Because if you are, you'll never be Depressed again. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. How many words was it? Three. So he's taken us from separation. And he's placed us in Christ. And seated us in heavenly places. And he's taken his Holy Spirit. And he's placed his Holy Spirit in us. And now, Jesus puts it so well. When he says, all you really need to do is remain in me. You see, the problem with many Christians is they don't remain or abide. They visit. They make moments out of their relationship with God instead of celebrating a oneness. As it's been said so well, the secret of our life as ministers is our oneness with God through Christ. I want to talk about remaining in him. Remaining in him. I want to talk about how that affects you. And causes you to have revival wherever you are. Because if you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to be disciples, there's going to be times when you're on your own. But if you know that he's in you and you remain in him, you're never alone. But you'll live with a persuasion that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 
I want to read to you from John 15, because Jesus, as he does everything, preaches this much better than what I could ever preach. But I want you to open your ears tonight, not for what you think you know, but for what the Holy Spirit causes to happen in you when we read the words of Jesus Christ. Tonight, I'm not looking for a Holy Spirit anointing to fall on you. I'm looking for a groundswell within you that comes from a revelation that you're joined to the vine. There's nothing wrong with laying on hands. There's nothing wrong in sharing a corporate anointing. But my friends, if you're going to be disciples, that has to be secondary to your personal pursuit. What do you give for people that you're leading? Your personal pursuit of God is your gift to the people you lead. So tonight, you know, yeah, we're going to enjoy the fire of God. But tonight, I'm believing the Holy Spirit is going to cause a fresh release within you. And people are going to be healed tonight. And no one's going to lay hands on you. Now, later on, we're going to lay hands on that. But what I'm saying is not because you're not going to be healed because someone wearing a flesh suit prayed for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But tonight, I really sense the Holy Spirit wants to wants to burst forth within you in a way that you're never the same again because you don't have to fear that you'll never feel that again. John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Two people from the Godhead are present and I remember reading that. All right, I am the true vine, that's you, Jesus. My father is the gardener. That's you, Father. Where's the Holy Spirit? And then it was so obvious. But whenever you have a vine that's alive, the life of the vine is present. You see, the Holy Spirit is as present there as the Father and the Son. And then Jesus says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. God expects fruitfulness from every one of you. And he's right to have that expectation. While every branch that does not, that does bear fruit, he prunes. Don't ever, don't ever moan about pruning. Count it a, an honor. I'm not talking when people are pruning you. But when God chooses that there's a season of pruning that needs to take place, you're being seasoned. See, some of you that recently stepped out of the crowd to follow Jesus, you may preach very loud, but a lot of it's just smoke and noise. Because if you want heat, you pick a seasoned log. So the Lord allows seasoning. There's nothing wrong with sweaty, spit-infused preaching. I love that. did that years for myself. But what I'm saying is that's not where God wants to leave you. He wants to season you. And when pruning comes, it seasons us. Until you've had a disappointment, you've not been seasoned like you will be. Until you've believed and it didn't yet happen. Until until you suddenly realize Phil and Sharon's faith isn't going to help you. You now need your own. But boy, when you're seasoned, then you begin to release heat. And you may say words quieter, but they impact the very spirit of cultures. So prune him. And then he carries on. He prunes you that you would be more fruitful. You see, the call of God and the expectation of God is fruitfulness. Especially from disciples. You're already clean because of a word I've spoken to you. And here it comes, the first of a few times here. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. I've termed this the order of existence. Now, newsflash for some some big celebrity evangelists. God doesn't exist because he's joined to you. Everything exists because it's joined to him. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit of itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. 
if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Not might. The same expectation we have of a healthy apple tree is the expectation we have of you when you go in the nations. If you're living an abiding life. And then it speaks, if anyone doesn't remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. You see, the funny thing is, is when you pull yourself away from the vine, it may look like you're still alive. But the process of death has begun. Because in him, we live. We move. And we have our being. There is no life outside of being joined to him. And then it says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you'll ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Jesus says numerous times there, remain in me. Now, this was an object lesson for his disciples. But I know that religion's taken the disciples and given them like big beards, little round glasses and made them about 80. But they were a bunch of lunatics like you. (laughs) Read about Peter. The guy was like, I'm going to cut his ear off. And that's after he'd walked with him. (laughs) I'm going to cut his ear off. And you had others coming. Phil would have said, lemons. (laughs) Lemons. (laughs) Lemon. But you see, Jesus sees what we will become. Not what we presently are. You see, our role is simply to get people joined to him. Not us. Not our ministries. To him. So that they can experience the life that comes from him into them. But our role is just to remain in him. That's it. Simple. It's actually a commandment, I believe. If you read through John 15, you know, it says, if you love him, you'll do what he says. He says, remain in me. Remain in me. If you live a life that remains in God, you'll attend revivals, but your presence will make them better. We've got too many Christians that are walking voids, that, that just always need someone to light their fire again. Now, I don't mind lighting the fire of anyone, but I'm not going to repeatedly do it if it's the produce of a lazy saint. I'm going to teach them how to walk in revival and how to keep a fire alive inside of them. Because the basic law of having a wood burner is you just need wood, you just need air, and you just need to put some effort in. You see, we all wake up in the morning not feeling our best, especially probably at the end of this revival week. Naturally, our bodies will be screaming, ow! But you see, when I wake up in the morning, people say to me, do you feel saved when you wake up? I don't feel human. It often takes me a cup of coffee, but I don't live by feelings. I live by faith in the word of God. I don't look in the mirror and say, are you human? I know I'm human. I I don't wait to feel like I'm spiritual or I'm connected. The Bible says I am. And all I need to do and all we need to do is live lives wherever God takes us. Lives that remain in him. You see, Jesus had to make this. So simple for the disciples to understand. And he does that with me. It's like sometimes he would take, it would, it would use everything to teach me something. And I'm so glad that he's patient. You know, some people, they kind of get it first time. And I'm like, I don't know, anyone else, it takes a few times sometimes to, and then you go, oh, oh yeah. yeah. And God's like, you got there, didn't you, kitten? You got there. Hey, we arrived, didn't we? I think the disciples were like that. Sometimes I think Jesus heard him talking and he was like rolling his divine eyes. Just like uh, listening to what he was saying. But this one day he said, okay, I've got to teach these cats. I've got to teach these, these young men, these disciples, the complexity of the, of the order of existence. Because if they don't grasp this, they will not survive when I ascend. And how does he do it? I love it that he doesn't set them in a lecture room. And say, right, we're going to have four sessions, a coffee break, and then some Q&A. It's brilliant. The way Jesus preaches and teaches, it's brilliant. He brings them to like a grapevine or a vine. And he says, now stay with me, boys. This is really important. 
Okay, we're with you, Master. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, you good? Yeah. You see the vine? Yes, Master. Do you see the branches? Yes, Lord. Can you see the fruit at the end of a branch? Yes, Lord. Okay, stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. All right? No, 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 don't talk. Stay with me. Me vine, you branch. (laughs) Mic drop. (laughs) And the disciples must have been like, (laughs) and? No, no, that's it. That's everything you need to know to live in revival, to change nations. Me vine, (laughs) you branch. You know, Matthew was a bit awkward, wasn't he? And, and, and Matthew was like, it's like people that handle too much money and stuff. They just, you know, you've got to go over it a few times, you know? <laughs> Stay with me. Vine. You? Branch. If. You remain in me. I remain in you. Pastor Andy, I knew this. No, 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 no. Are you living in the good of it? Is this affecting every day and every morning of your life? Is this determining how you respond when everything's coming against you? Because if it's not, you you don't know as you are. You, You have head knowledge, but God wants to bring revelation. See, this affects how we live. I love going to revival meetings. I love being a part of revival meetings. But it's not what I depend upon. What I depend upon is I wake up. Can I let you into, again, some of you are listening to the depth of my teaching tonight. And saying, he's like a genius. How does he hold all of that information in his cranium? I can see it in your faces. But actually, my life is quite simple. I like it that way. And some of you are like, I wonder how we praise in the morning. I'll let you in on a secret. This is my morning, all right? I get out of bed and I say, whew. Thank you, Lord. You're divine. And I'm the branch. My life is remaining in you. So today, your life is my life. Your faith is my faith. Your authority. I'm not asking my senses how I'm feeling about that. They don't join in until after coffee normally anyway. (laughs) Because you see, everything that's in the vine is in the branch. And when a person learns... Now, you've probably been taught... You've probably been taught that the favourite words of Christianity are things like grace. It's rubbish. The, 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 The... The favourite word of a believer should be obedience. And if you want another one, submission. Because as you submit to what God is doing and wants to do, fruit is produced without effort. Come on, we've got to understand. It's like turn from your wicked ways. People turn from their wicked ways and they end up looking like that. No, it said turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your will to his will. Turn from your way of living to hit. There's a maneuver that takes place. So, okay, when we wake up in the morning, we can have revival in our bathroom. Sometimes we need to, to add some wood. We need to open the word. This is so simple, right? And as we read the word, suddenly a fire begins to, to come inside. Sometimes we need to add a little bit of wind or, or some oil. Oh, that's when you pray in the Holy Spirit. That's when you pray in the Holy Spirit. Boy, that'll wake you up. Sometimes when I get out of bed, I've got to be honest with you, because if I lie to you about this, I lie to you about other things, and I don't want to do that. (laughs) I get out of bed, and and, and I'm like, all right, I need to pray in the Holy Spirit. But it's like walking through porridge. You know, I'd love you to imagine I jump out of bed like perky. (laughs) 
but my people, I'm just like you. <laughs> I get out sometimes and I'm like, and it's just like the engine's choking a bit, you know? And then your mind kicks in. You just need toast. Toast isn't going to change the world here. Toast isn't what you need. You need another hour of sleep. Your mind begins to negotiate with you. But if you push through, and, and this takes me to the bathroom. I enter the bathroom like, but in the bathroom, oh, suddenly God begins to add milk to the porridge. Begins to loosen up. And, you know, when I come out of the bathroom, the door flies open. And I'm, you know? And I'm ready. And all I did was abide in him. Because what's in him is in me. What's in the vine is in... Do you know, Christians say we get this. Then why do you look like constipated apple trees? If you get this. Have you ever met one of them? They come up and they go... Always oh, got that face on, like uh, 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 not sinners, like people that need help. Just Christian, uh, and they walk up to you and they go, uh, "I'm working on patience. Uh, so hard, so hard is working on." And they're normally the ones that when they're fasting, they just can't help themselves. They come up and they, they think because they're whispering, it doesn't disqualify them from, they, they go, I'm blind. It's like, have you ever heard? They go, I'm blind. As if like doing it like that doesn't mean that you've lost your reward on heaven, you know? Anyway, back to, uh, I'm working on patience. Now, now think about it. Think about it. Then branch... Him vine. If they just remain in him, everything that's in him, the fruit of the spirit, the life of the spirit, has free access in them. Um, Imagine if you went to an apple orchard, okay? And you're sitting in an apple orchard, leaning against a tree, okay? Around the time when apples are born. I don't know what they say about that. Are we born or... When apples are born... And all of a sudden you're sitting there and all the apple tree starts going. <laughs> leaning on an apple tree next to it. <laughs> and all of a sudden it gives us it's almighty. <laughs> and <laughs> out comes an apple. And it's like, whoa! <laughs> whoa! <laughs> whoa! <sighs> You'd be like, what is going on? This isn't normal. This isn't natural. Neither is a believer straining to produce the fruit of the life of the vine within them. They're straining because they're not drawing upon and giving expression to the life of the Holy Spirit. When we opened the church, I've always abided in the vine, John 15, it's always been near me, hasn't it? And when we planted the church, a handful of people, weren't there? 12 people and a cat or something like that, wasn't there? I hate cats. Um, I love people. Um, and, and I said, I'm going to call the church. You know, I'm going to call the church. Abide in the vine. Because it was my revelation. It's what changed me. And so we had all our T-shirts done up. Of course, you have a big bunch of grapes. That's always fitting. And I'd abide in the vine, family church. And I'd walk around the neighborhood like. Yeah. Yeah. And one day I was putting the rubbish out, the garbage out. And my next door neighbor, who's like was not a Christian at all. He came up to me and he saw my t-shirt and he says, I'm a part of a wine. And so I instantly changed the name of the church over to family church. But you see, I didn't change my mission statement. 
Now, when church got all trendy the last few years, people made whole walls of their mission statement. You'd walk into the foyer and it would be like subsection here, subsection there. You know, the church exists for. But mine was always very simple because I'm a very simple person and I like to do things simply. And I used to always feel really embarrassed when people said, what's your mission statement? Because I changed the name, but I didn't change the mission statement. And they said, no, no. I said, you don't want to know. I said, no, we really do. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. It's quite quick, so listen. Here is my vision, my mission statement. Break them off. Go after them in. Teach them how to suck sap. <laughs> no, I am done there. That's it. Because you see, that is the gospel. It says in, in, in Romans 11 that, that we were broken off from, from an old root that we were all joined to. But God didn't leave us in the middle of a garden. He brought us and joined us back to the tree that was our, our tree of origin. The tree that was first given for Adam to eat of, the spirit life. You see, Jesus ended the separation between us and the life of God. He made the way open that we could know the life of God. Not in meetings, but in our daily lives. As we just simply abide. He didn't just re- remove the proximity between God and man. He removed the blockages that stopped a man, a woman, someone like you and me, drawing and living daily on the spirit life of God. There's nothing stopping you knowing and drawing on the spirit life of God today. If you're a new creation believer, there's nothing stopping you but you. But that can change in a moment. See, Romans says that we were broken off from an old root that was wild by nature. I know it's speaking of Israel, and that, but it speaks of us. And when I read that, I'm like, it's a reverse maneuver of Genesis. You see, in Genesis, man was made and joined to the life of God. Man was to know the life of God daily. You know, God didn't rock up in the garden for a chat at four o'clock. There was a union between man and God. And when man chose disobedience, that union was cut. They remained alive physically and mentally. But the spiritual life that had once run through the branch of who they were was now gone. And man remained dead until Jesus Christ went to the cross. My friends, our only boast should be the cross. Our only boast should be the cross. And in that moment, I know Jesus died once and for all. And when somebody believes they don't, he doesn't die again, I get all that. But just stay with me in the thought of this. But to me... The moment someone receives Jesus, if you imagine a tree here and a tree there, the tree that they were always destined to know, the life of God, the tree that they were connected in, which was the nature of Satan, with the devil being their father. The moment a person says, Jesus, I believe in you, I receive the new creation life, the new birth you have for me. In many ways, I visualize it like Jesus walking back across the garden. And taking hold of a branch of their life that's been subject to the nature of the root it's been joined to by birth. And Jesus breaks it off. But he doesn't leave us in the garden to wither. No, the plan of redemption was more glorious than that. He walks back across the garden. And he joins us back to the vine that we were always meant to know. And all of a sudden, a new nature begins to come through us. You see, we do not preach a gospel of behavior modification. We do not put plasters on people, band-aids on people. We bring them through the process of death to a brand new life. And the nature of God begins to flow in them. It happened to me, and no pastor knew how to tell me what was happening. Now, when I came back to God at 24, my life was a mess. And I didn't have anyone preaching righteousness to me until Brother Vaughan came along and started to impart into my life. But I know the moment after I was born again, everything inside of me had changed. I, 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 I was out of control. I didn't steal because I needed to. I thought, why not? And I remember the next day after I was born again, I went into the local store to help myself to the free chocolate. 
which was nothing new. It was my lifestyle. And I remember I put my hand on that chocolate bar. And an alarm went off inside of me. I was like, whoa, what is? You see, the life of the vine was flowing and it was changing everything. He was changing everything. He, suddenly, I was in a terrible relationship that was built on nothing but physical things. And I felt such a weirdo when I had to say to this lady, I can't sleep with you anymore. I felt such a weirdo. Because inside, I couldn't do it anymore. Everything I'd been, I never tried to be a sinner. It came naturally. I just unknowingly yielded to the vine that I was joined to by Adam. And every morning woke up. I never, I never ever remember going, oh, I just can't go out tonight, get drunk and punch someone in the face. I just can't do it. I just haven't got it in me today. All I did was yield to the nature of the vine I was joined to and let it express its life through mine. Now, here's some good news. I'm not joined here anymore. Okay, good news. There's a hole where I used to be. And perverse weirdness is pumping out of it. (laughs) (laughs) Strangeness. But good news, I'm over here. You see, and the life of God is flowing in and through. And everywhere the river runs, it brings life. Come on, we've got to move from this Western mindset that we go somewhere to collect something to allowing those moments to just enhance and be extras to our regular menu of remaining in him. So that's us. Let me just finish with this. When we grasp the reality of this, ministering to others becomes very simple. Because all we do is we allow our life to be a conduit from his life and what he wants to do in them. Come on, have you ever been in one of those Pentecostal meetings where you go forward with a headache and the guy grabs your head like a melon and like pierces your brain with his... his <laughs> I'm like, now I've got a splitting headache. I feel no better. Or they like shove you on the floor and you're like, thank you. You see, in our dramatic way of living, we think doing it that way will add to the effect. God doesn't need your help. He needs you to be a point of connection from him to them. People get really disappointed when I pray for them these days. Because I used to be awesome. Like If you came to me and you had a need, it was awesome. Lord! And then I'd spend 10 minutes telling God what the issue was. <laughs> Probably, you know, This is what this person needs. And God's like, thanks, Andy. <laughs> Didn't know that. <laughs> right, now we know what to do. You know, it's like, it's like where, where it, this is learned behavior. We've got to begin to let the Holy Spirit teach us. I was in, um, I was in Louisiana uh, last year. And uh, a lovely lady came up. And uh, again, anyone believe a word where it just says you speak to the thing, right? And so this lady came up to me and uh, she said, will you pray for me? I said, yeah, absolutely. And uh, she said, I can't conceive a child. I just can't conceive a child. And, and I've tried and I've tried to conceive a child. It's just, it just never happens. Will you pray for me? I said, would love to. That would be a privilege. I said, I just want to warn you, my prayer is really short. Just want to, just so you're not disappointed. I don't pray very long. And she said, no, that's okay. It's okay. And I said to her and her husband, are you ready? They said, yeah. I said, Become pregnant. I was done. And I could see on their faces like, was was that it? Nine months later, she was holding the baby. You see, it's not about us. It's about us giving expression to his life. All we do is give expression to his life. In our worship, in our praise, in everything we do. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. We give expression to his life. I reckon there's going to be a surge of sap tonight. Because some of you stop looking for something to fall on you. And you realize it's bubbling within you. 
On the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood on a box and he said, Is anyone thirsty? Come to me and drink. And out of your innermost being will begin to flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit, who had not yet been given. Newsflash, he's been given. And the only thing that's stopping him bubbling out of your innermost being is ignorance or stubbornness. Because if God will do it for one, he'll do it for all. Come on, Holy Spirit, begin to, begin to move now. Deep within, deep within. Holy Spirit, just begin to move right now. Come on, you branch, him vine. We don't, can't really make it much simpler, can we? Him vine, you branch. Him vine. Why are you always happy? Because God's happy. Next question. People say, you're so happy you must battle depression. No, I really don't. I'm just happy. Is that okay? I know it doesn't fit into like psychological profiling and that, but I'm just happy. Because if you read on in that chapter, it says, if you abide in me and I'll abide in you and you'll know joy. I don't know, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Can we park there for a second? Love, joy. If you ever meet a Christian like, I love God, but I hate that person. What Bible are you even reading? <laughs> and, and, and like, what's happening inside of you right now? Can I shine a torch in your eyes? Because this is weird. Joy, peace. All this stuff is just the life of the vine to which we're joined to. Because God has ended the separation that once divided man and him. And he's joined us to himself. And what we've got to learn is just begin to say, yes, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For, thank you. I can feel people at, right now, there's a surge happening. God wants you to get this so that when you're on the mission field and there's no one to pray for you, no one, you can just go and have a, a one-man revival all on your own. Yeah? Just, just come out like, it's like, I need someone to pray. No, 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 no. no. The Holy Spirit, he, he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Jesus promised that. Anyone else hearing that? Oh, it's Libby. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to stay. I'm trying, Phil. I'm trying. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Holy Spirit's moving. Holy Spirit's moving. I've just pumped the engine there a little bit to get it going, you know? Sometimes you've got to like wet the engine a little bit, you know? Come on. You need peace, just begin to receive it right now. But brother, you've got to squeeze my head. No, I don't. I really don't. You've got to blow on me. I had garlic. You don't want me to blow on you, seriously. If you're desperate, I will. Um, now, don't hear me wrong. I, 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 I'm all about laying hands and, and I'm all about doing stuff. I'm, I'm not against that, but I think when the, the people of God rely on that, they're, they're kind of, they're missing the point. <laughs> I knew you'd be trouble. I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Get her, Lord, right now. Saturate her. That's coming out of your belly. Hey, it's better than the stuff you used to drink, right? 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 Come on, Holy Spirit. Just begin to show them. It's between you and them. It's between you and them, Lord. It's between you and them, Lord. It's between you and them. Not me, I ain't touched no one. I ain't touched no one. Filled! Filled! Not coming down. Rising up. No, we coming down, eh? Rise, he uppy. Oh, now we're in trouble here. Now we're in trouble. I don't want to be happy. Well, it's not about what you want. It's not about what you want. God wants you happy. Woo. Out of your inner... Isn't that what Jesus said? Out of your inner... But you haven't waved your coat at me. I haven't got one. I didn't bring one. I've got a tracksuit top. <laughs> Le 
Let sicknesses begin to get healed right now. There's been an attack of sickness against ATM. ATM, that's a cash machine, isn't it? AMT. <laughs> Taking an offering, right? That's a good point to take an offering. <laughs> ATM, that's terrible, isn't it? That's without trying. I'll just stand up. Just lift your hands. <laughs> Fill him up, Lord. Directly from you to him listen I don't need to do a sonic push or anything like that sometimes sometimes some of the deepest work that the Lord does can be in the most quietest moments I've known people I've known people fall down repeatedly and never change they became expert faller overs and then I've seen people just stand and God revolutionize their life. <sighs> greater things, greater things, greater things are to come. As you've proved faithful in the house of God. As you've proved faithful in the house of God. So not just this ministry, but the Lord's going to put more responsibility upon you. Know that you're not a, a small pillar, but you're a great pillar. That if people could see the spiritual strength within you, they would be amazed at the strength that's compacted within your life. Strength that I've compacted over the years in moments when other people didn't see. In choices you choose to make when others weren't even listening. I saw the choices that you make and I've made you strong for, to hold a lot more. The things you're holding now seem a lot. But listen, as you follow Phil and Sharon into your future, your life is going to be holding more and more. But never will you feel the pressure of those things creating a crack within you because you know my life is your strength. Greater things, Lord, greater things. You see, when we prophesy, all we do is we give expression to, to another who's talking. You know? You know? Often we're prophesying and we don't realize we're doing it till halfway during a conversation, eh? It, uh, I'm going to annoy something that's frightened some of you and come out of here a little bit. Huh? Oh, no, we're not safe now. No, you're not. You're not. You're not. Not at all. Not at all. Not at you. You didn't expect this from an Englishman, did you? You really didn't. You thought, he's going to be proper. Are you following me? Okay, careful. I'm trained. I, I can suddenly turn. I, I, did, I did AMT. I know how to, I know how to do that. Come on, God wants to give you what you need tonight. Do I have to laugh? No, you need to just let God give you what he's given you. Some of you need peace. Some of you need, some of you need the Holy Spirit to do something else. Oh yeah, we were talking about healing, weren't we? There's been an attack, an assignment against this ministry. Not ATM, AMT. Right now, the Spirit rises a standard against it. If you've been battling illness or sickness in any way, stand to your feet right now and lift your hands. If you've been under attack, if the doctors have told you something's unchangeable, if it's been, if, if it's been a headache, a head cold or anything, uh, if it's been a cancer or anything, you stand to your feet right now. You stand to your feet right now. God's got something for you. God's got something for you. He wants to deliver it directly from the vine into who you are. Okay, just so stand there a second. In the name of Jesus. Sickness. Leave. Body. Recover. Body. Recover. In Jesus' name. Depression. Get off of that person right now. This one. Simple. So easy. So easy. People can miss it. It's happening right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Remember, it's not coming from outside of you. It's rising up within you right now. The Holy Spirit's mending sinews and fibers right now. Lily, be healed. 
this distraction stops. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, you know, this is where it gets really exciting. Now that there's something going on between the vine and the branch, we release the ministers to begin to pray for you. Can you see what I did there? I'm taking away, it's all about the man. They're going to join in with what the Holy Spirit's doing with you right now. They're going to come and we're going to get rid of some chairs in a couple of moments. And we're going to ask some of the ministers just to begin to come alongside you and just say, we agree. We agree. We agree. Bring prophetic words. Bring thoughts. Is that okay? So just wait a moment. There's something happening in this moment. There's something happening in this moment. God's giving people new tongues in this moment. You see, if you're going to change the world, you, you need tongues. We've got to understand they're real. It's a heavenly language. I was doing a men's meeting a little while ago. Well, a couple of years ago now. And I just grabbed the mic to transition the meeting. And like, like you would normally do, I just begun to... A gentleman who was there was, was Argentinian. And he, 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 he just almost looked in shock. And I said to him, what's the matter? He said, do you speak fluent Spanish? I said, I've never learned a language in my life. I just about speak English. And he said, then why are you speaking fluent Spanish right now? And I said, what am I saying? And I expected random words like frog, broom, hand. And I was going to tie it together, you know. And he said, no, it's beautiful. What you're saying is the Holy Spirit says, worship him. The Holy Spirit says, worship him. Worthy, worthy. The whole. Come on, this stuff's real. Let's not know. Let's know as we all. Let's know as we all. I was in a real desperate situation a couple of years ago with, one of, uh, with a situation. And I didn't know what to do. And the Lord said to me and Gina, you just need to be praying in the Holy Ghost more than you ever have. And, and I remember being in a hotel room um, and, and laying out a towel, like, like the Christian version of a Muslim, I suppose. I just laid out a bathroom towel and got on it. Just, and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, why, do you know why I want you to pray in the Spirit? And I said, go on, Lord, tell me. He said, because it's uncorrupted by your soul. The words you speak are uncorrupted by your soul. There's no agenda. There's no greed. It's pure. Come on, he's trading in rusty tongues right now. He's trading in rusty tongues right now. Come on. Come on, speak mysteries. Speak mysteries tonight. She, come on, that's it, out of you. Give expression to the life of the vine. Give expression. Come on, all over this place. Let's stand to our feet right now. Let's stand to our feet. Give ex-